Oh, speaking of, Dr. I heard Nam. you say that. Well, thanks for coming back. I was I was sweating it there for a minute. You're our, you're our keynote tonight. I, I, I didn't know. play a joke on you and uh, <laughs> respond to your email saying, sorry, boys, I got COVID. I can't make it. That's but. right. Well, let's get this party started. I mean, um, you know, you know, everybody, thanks so much for, for joining the party. Um, you know, uh, Troy and I kind of put this program together a few months back. We really thought that COVID had punched a lot of people right in the face. And, you know, me as a consultant, seeing a lot of numbers, uh, obviously not being what we wanted these practices to be and and for the obvious reason of everybody being signlined and you know we wanted to put on a program tonight that uh inspired uh an opportunity to grow revenue with with the with the shorter year so to speak um using digital dentistry and i and i must say that you know a lot of conversations about cancellations and hygiene and the ups and downs and the potential of hygiene dropping out later and, you know, the team coming back and you might not be full go, you know, the easiest way to really, you know, grow your revenue is, is truly taking a, uh, a look at, you know, how you're presenting cases and what tools you're using to get people to say yes. And, and ultimately to get people to see, you know, uh, exactly what, they need and how they want to take care of themselves. And so, you know, the theme of this tonight is, is truly just to empower you to really look at your case presentation process and, uh, and just really, you know, have a, a great conversation about it. Um, although it's a webinar format, um, I'll just kind of lay it out that any questions you have, go to the question and answer box, uh, type in your question there. The panelists will see that. Um, we'll, we'll get to a questionnaire at the end here. Um, you, you can vote those questions up. I know a lot of you have been on webinars before with the AGD. If there's a question that someone else has uh, asked, just go ahead and vote and it'll pop up higher in the, in the list. But, you know, this is kind of an intimate setting and it was meant to be tonight. And so we'll get to every question. Um, I could even invite people to come in live uh, and ask the question. So we might go that route too. Um, all righty. So let's, let's kind of get right into it. Um, so tonight, uh, well, let me get, get to the agenda here. Um, so basically next level consultants going to start this off by talking about case presentation and really working through the processes of, of how a patient comes in the door and, and ultimately schedules and books treat, treatment. Uh, we got Dr. Michael Young in the house. Um, I'll just go ahead and give you a, a, a formal introduction now, Doc. Thanks for being on and being a part of the show. Um, you know, big, big picture, Dr. Dr. Young started CAD CAM, he's, he was telling us as early as 2004. Um, you know, he was doing same day dentistry. He's been doing it for over 16 years. Um, thousands and thousands of uh, restorations through that, that technology incorporated 3D imaging in 2015. Uh, he even got into two, uh, printing, 3D printing in 2017. Um, you know, and what we really wanted him to deliver tonight is, you know, how does he use this technology to ultimately uh, create efficiency, drive revenue, and ultimately get patients to say yes and take care of themselves better. So, um, you know, he, he coined this this idea of digital dentist, the digital dentistry puzzle, and he's going to go into that. And I'm pretty excited about uh, having him on. So thanks, Dr. Young, for being here, bud. Thank you. I appreciate it. You know that uh, the picture you have there is inspiring me to go for a run when we're done. <laughs> well, uh, we'll have to do another one of these and hold you accountable to, to, to whatever your goals are, buddy. <laughs> Got to um, do something. Yeah, that's right. Well, you look great. Um, <laughs> and then, of course, Troy. Troy, you know, th thanks for being here, brother. I know this was kind of your brainchild, and I and I and I appreciate you uh, bringing it to next level and us kind of spearheading this thing, man. You you are the imaging guru. I've known you for eight, eight, nine, ten maybe years. Um, which goodness, you you've had uh, a long career with Cavo, now with Plan Mecca. Um, you know, you threw out a statistic the other day. You're the longest tenured digital rep in the area 
by somewhere around seven to nine years is the next most experience. So, I mean, on the manufacturing side. Yeah. Yeah. Which is, which is crazy, dude. Um, and, and I know that your passion and your, 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 your why, so to speak, a why you do what you do is to, is to truly be a, a digital strategic resource for doctors that ultimately can drive revenue. So, um, thank you both. I, I think this is going to be an awesome program. And, and even if our, our viewers take 10% of this, like, I feel like it will actually impact their practice. So thanks again, um, for, for both of you, uh, Troy, for helping me put it together and doctor to, to be our, our main speaker tonight. Um, real quick about next level. If you don't guys don't know who I am founded in 2016, uh, we are a full service consulting firm. It started out as a buyer's representation firm, also a startup coaching firm, but we found that, you know, doctors needed our help post transition. And so I've hired now, uh, well not hired, but have consultants that contract with me. We have about three now hygiene front and uh and a credentialing insurance expert and so now we are a full service uh a full service firm which is super cool because um not only are we helping doctors get into ownership the right way but then we are helping them grow their practice from there which is which is great and it's super fulfilling work um we are an in-office consulting firm so no matter where you're at in the country uh we will be in your office coaching your team which is which is great um so that kind of leads us to the agenda again, next level for 30 minutes. Uh, it might be a little bit sooner. Um, Dr. Young for an hour, he's gonna work you through his workflows and go through some cases, which, which Troy and I got a preview of that. I'm super excited uh, to see you delivering that live. And then back to Troy over at Plan Mecca to kind of put an end cap on this thing. And, and Troy, I, I cut you off at 20, but you could take 40 if you want, buddy. But um, then we're going to go into Q&A and, and wrap this up. And if Q&A is only five minutes, then we all go home early and Dr. Young can, can go to bed there in Michigan and, and we'll try not to take you to midnight. Um, the rest of us in the Northwest and Mountain States, you guys can stay on the, on the horn as long as you want. So let me get right into my, my stuff. Um, I, I label my, my, my uh, presentation as let's go ahead and get you scheduled, right? Because, uh, what I would like to do is challenge the folks on the phone to really look at the process that they take as patients call into the office and work their way through the sales funnel. Um, but before I really get into case presentation and patient finance, uh, sorry, patient uh, uh, financial arrangements, which is a big piece of, of uh, case acceptance, I, I wanted to throw this out. I always start something with my, my presentations that um, you know, change just in general is super hard. Uh, I, I recognize that COVID's difficult. I recognize that team, team members oftentimes have, get the best of us uh, with, with the lack of, of dental assistance and hygienists out there. And there's all kinds of, of pressures to, to, that prevent you all from being super, super successful or maybe more successful than you, than you, than you are today. Um, but ch change is inevitable and, and COVID happened to us and it, it's, it's making us adapt. I mean, the fact that we're on a, a Zoom call right now, I didn't know how to work Zoom a minute ago. And now all of a sudden I'm hosting uh, Zoom webinars right now. Like that's how fast it's, it's uh, d developing. But, you know, when you, when you consider ch uh, implementing change in your office, like 3D imaging, like printing, like CAD CAM, wh whatever you're introducing, I want you to think about the priority, or as I call it, the priority change of command, not the, the chain of command. I, I thought that was clever, and maybe, maybe I'm fooling myself, but the priority change of command. And when you're thinking about Im implementing things in your office, I always want you to stack rank the priority to patient first, practice next, team, and self. And that's really important. Every time you're making a decision, go to that. If you're making a decision about you first, that's, that's a problem. And maybe you should really be thinking about why you're making that change. Uh, something that I get a lot as a consultant is we need to make this change because of our team, because they want it. Well, if, you, if, you, if you're constantly chasing what your team wants, you're just going to be spiraling and, and chasing your tail. Uh, maybe Dr. Young could talk about that in his practice. But if you have a vision and you have something that you want to implement it, and you, and you think it's the best thing for the patient, 
then then you know you're on the right the the right path and then practice and then team and then self and then ultimately get to the decision so it's such a simple i got to do the opposite with the video it's such a simple process here right a patient practice team self and then make that decision but but just always have that 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 change of command in, in the top of your head there as you implement some of these things um okay so this is going to be like the pinnacle of my entire uh presentation um you know i i could probably just speak to this slide the entire night but what this represents really is if you think about like all of the time energy and money that you put into getting patients to call you marketing dollars you know internal marketing dollars dealing with the insurance companies um instagram facebook all of this stuff you know m time money and energy and 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 it is a lot you know i work with a lot of startups i work a lot with uh, struggling practice or smaller practices and someone's looking to grow them and a lot of money goes into getting that phone to ring if you'll notice on the left side of this powerpoint you'll see a bunch of question marks and it's because as you work through the funnel right we all talk about case presentation from step four to seven. We all talk about it in the dentistry. I always go into office and I say, doctor, what do you think your case acceptance is? Oh, at least 80%, 80, 70% at least. Well, what they are probably referencing is the treatment presented to the treatment schedule. And you'll notice that's at 65%. And that is a national average, 65%. From, from presenting, to scheduled but if you look actually looked at how much how many dollars is presented and how many is actually completed the national average is closer to 40 percent okay so these are some numbers that you probably have heard in the industry but i'm wondering from step one to four what are those percentages the incoming call how many of those calls are we converting to scheduled how many of those scheduled are actually showing up and not canceling how many of those can you know how many of the people are actually showing up are we presenting treatment and that's what you can control as doctors and then from that treatment are we are we offering financial arrangements to help people get there then how many are scheduled and then how many is actually being completed okay and if you look on the right side here you th these are all things that matter in each part in each each process or each part of the, the process you know i've been in say I, I was in sales for a long time before i became a consultant and we always thought like you know troy sorry bud i'm, I'm gonna call you a salesman but you are you're a sales guy you have a you have a sales funnel everybody's got a sales funnel there's no reason why dentistry dentists don't need to think about the sales funnel just like all the other sales organizations in, the, in everywhere right it's always a funnel right and if you're not tracking eat from one to two two to three and actually putting percentages you might have something broke um I, I will say just picking up the phone how you're picking it up what that front office person is saying you know um how they're just are you smiling on the phone are you are you curious about what the patient is asking you or are you just quickly answering it do you, do you offer delta yes i do like or no i don't right just quick answers versus why do you ask that what what what, what brings you into it or why are you calling today get curious right be the solution don't be the problem that's just with picking up the phone right we can go through each one of these steps and and really deep dive into how you're converting from one to two two to three and so on right so i just wanted to bring that up to you uh kind of getting into a little bit more well backing up here getting into from like number four to seven is this, is this slide so i always say what what gets tracked gets done it's so true if you don't track it it's just gone it's just a gut feeling it's why i walk into offices every single day saying what's your case acceptance and they think it's a hundred percent it's not it's 40 percent or 60 percent right depending on what we're talking about so let's break this down a little bit so track this stuff and there's performance softwares by the way that make this really easy companies like dental intel and practice by numbers and there's a there's a bunch of them make this stuff really really easy but if you want to go old school and if you've heard of any of my other webinars up to this point 
you know, dropping some of those third party expenses during COVID was an okay thing for people. As we reset and get more profitable, you might want to consider getting it back and, you know, start tracking it. But if you weren't using it, go longhand, get a spreadsheet, have your front office person longhand track this stuff. But the first bullet point is cases presented versus patients scheduled. And that's that 65% gut feeling that I get a lot from doctors. Oh, I, they rescheduled, they scheduled. I, I told them what they needed. And we, we put the case on this cool computer here and, and they, they scheduled. Uh, I know they did. And so that's why I get that gut feeling of 100%. The national average is actually 65%. So hold yourself to it. But what's really, really interesting is, you know, look at dollars presented versus dollars accepted. Now that is a true number. Because if you, if you presented three fillings, right, call it nine, six to $900, depending on what area you are and whatever your fee schedules are, and they only accepted one filling, a $200, $300, that's that 45% goal. So if you're actually tracking dollars to dollars, right, presented dollars versus accepted dollars, that's, you, that's what's really going to move the needle for you is you got to look at why didn't they accept the other two fillings or so on and so forth, right? And using imaging and using technology to help people say yes is ultimately where we're going with this presentation. Um, production dollars per exam is another thing that I like to track. So overall, you know, your dollars, uh, your dollars in production, not collections, but production, divided by how many exams you did. And, you know, if you're a big case, like full mouth re restore, or if you're just a bread and butter, which is totally fine to have either, either, either type of business, but depending on your business, that's a good number. You know, it should be about 800 to, to $1,200 per patient, per example, ish. Okay. So hold yourself to those numbers, track it. And, uh, and when something's broke, try to fix it, dig in and really, and, and take a deep dive in there. What's, what's going to help, whether your communication is good or your team's handoffs are good or throw out all of that stuff, imaging makes it so much easier. You might be, your team might not be great at communication. You might not be good at sales. And by the way, guys, Dr. Young, Troy, tonight we're allowed to say sales. I'm giving us all permission to call it sales, not, not uh, enrollment. Okay, let's just call it sales tonight. We can and end the webinar and call it Kate, you know, enrollment, but tonight it's sales. Um, so you guys can use that, but you know, for sales, so to, patients, you know, they only know what they know. And, and that's kind of why I love that. I wasn't a dental consultant for a hundred years because I think like a patient, sometimes I step back and I think, well, what would a patient think? They don't know what some of these definitions are that we say, they don't know what an SRP is. And I hear, I hear offices using terminology and stuff, and it just doesn't resonate. And so they only know what they know. And seeing is believing. I say, you know, Instagram, next level. I'm constantly trying to post stuff. I try to get my patients to do the same. Why is Instagram so, so popular? And Facebook is kind of losing. And why Facebook bought Instagram? It's people hate reading. Even, even if it's a Facebook post, they don't want to read, you know? Now, no one wants to read the novels. We can all agree with, you know, why you're eating spaghetti tonight and, and some weird theory or conspiracy on spaghetti. I don't care about any of that. But a picture works, and, and that's, you know, the Instagram era is proving that. Um, so keep in mind, you know, le less talking, more showing. And I'm going to say, you know, we're all at a seventh grade level. I mean, reading level. So... I, I say that just because know who your audience is, right? And that's kind of getting me to my next slide is you can't do any of this. You can't connect with any patient without knowing what's in, most important to that patient. You know, again, taking it away from dentistry and just sales, if I don't understand what your problem is and not get inquisitive and curious on whoever I'm selling, how am I going to sell somebody if I don't understand their problems, right? And, and, I, and we, we need to be solution providers to those problems, right? That's why Next Level doesn't do templated consulting programs because every office has different problems. So I have to go into offices and see what's going on and then put a plan together on what's going on, right? And, that, and that's me finding out what's most important about your practice. 
But from a patient's perspective, if you and your team are not figuring out what's most important to every single one of your patients, your case acceptance will go down. But rather, if you could figure out how to identify which patients are, are connecting with aesthetics or money or health or convenience, your, your case acceptance will go up. Let me, let me use the most, um, the most uh, common answer. I, I, too many times I'll walk into office and they'll be so focused on insurance, insurance, insurance. We're just all assuming that everybody's wired by money and money is always a, a conversation, which is why I'm going to be talking about financial arrangements next. But, but a guy like me, I, you know, I see value in wellness. I care about my health. Uh, uh, almost above any any of these other any of these other bullet points. So if you tell me that I have decay and if I don't fix it, it's going to make my whole body not feel good, and I'm and I'm susceptible to all other kinds of things. And you really educate me about my wellness. I don't care what the price is. I want to fix it. Right? There's going to be other people where same problem. I've got some decay and I don't have the money. If you're not figuring out what's most important to that particular patient, then now all of a sudden you got to figure out, okay, this person's very sensitive about money. So we got to talk about if we don't fix this problem now, it's going to cost you more over the, long, the, the course of, of that person's, uh, you know, uh, history with you. You know, if uh, a filling turns into a crown, turns into a root canal, which turns into an implant, all of these are a lot more expensive. So if someone is very uh, money focused, we need to educate them how this is going to cost you even more if you don't get it done, right? But it all starts with, well, what's most important to you, Mr. Patient or Mrs. Patient? And so I would, I would, you know, those new patient forms, sometimes when we get new patients in, we, we just kind of check it off, like the protocols just to ask these questions, right, to new patient. But why not incorporate this, this system and dig into what's most important to that particular patient, mark that in their file, and, and, and have that available when something is happening with their mouth, and drilling down on what's most important to that particular patient so that you can ultimately get the result you want. So again, get curious, understand your patient on a personal level, and then start se selling them or educating them on what's most important to them. Does it, I hope that makes sense. Um, okay. So kind of going back to that funnel, you know, again, learning who, what kind of patient you're talking to and what's most important to them and answering the phone and figuring out if they're canceling or not. But once you get them in and you've presented the case, now, if it is about money, you got to have more options for patients, especially in a pre-COVID world. Most people don't have money. It's 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 a fact, and that's where these these uh, these quotes are coming from. If you've been on one of my web webinars before, I've I've spoken about this, so sorry for the reiteration. But we're going to be talking about some bigger cases here, and financial arrangements are such a big piece of bigger cases. So, you know, this is just mind blowing to me. The average American savings account medium balance is forty five hundred dollars. A Gen Xer, an older Gen Xer, 45 to 54, 58% of that group has less than $1,000, okay? And of those people that have, that have less than 1,000, 40% that has zero dollars. So that's probably close to 20, 24, uh, 25, 26, 27% have zero dollars? Like, mind-blowing, right? So... Why, why is that important? So we really need to figure out if someone is money conscious, everybody's money conscious. But again, if you took me, for example, I'm big into convenience and I'm big into wellness. So I, I, I know how I'm going to probably pay for it, but we're going to go through a little exercise here, but just call, calling it out. Like if someone is trying to pay or wants the treatment, we got to offer them more options, five million billion, five billion dollars gets financed per year. And what's interesting about this is I've been um, 
I've been actually looking at my client's care credit data and, 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 and there's offices doing $2.5 million. They're seeing, they're seeing in production and they're seeing so many patients. They offered three people. I just looked at it yesterday, three people care credit this year so far. No, no. Last year, 2019, three people, they offered care credit. Like that's not getting it done. You have to offer a solution to every single patient because you don't know if they need it or don't. And we've all heard the story of the guy with sweat, sweatpants as a million dollar, you know, millionaire. And the person that dresses really nice has zero dollars. So you can't discriminate here. And so you have to offer options 100% of the time. And if you do, your case acceptance will go up. It's a fact. And this study was actually done by, by Care Credit. Um, of all of your patients walking in, depending on your demographics, you know, blue collar, white collar areas, whatever, but just in general, 50% of people have a plan 50% of the time to use their insurance. The people that don't have insurance, the other 30% have cash or credit available to them. But then there's this 20% slice that have no idea if you presented them a $5,000, $2,000, $500 case. They have no idea how they're gonna how they're gonna pay for that. So, um, so I guess what I'm saying is just get as many options in your office as possible. There's credit options, in-house financing options, and then of course wellness or membership plans. And we all know what these are. You know, the care, the care credits are credit. It's where the patient's getting their credit pulled, and that that third party company gives you the doctor the money. And that patient is making payments to them with interest rate. That's credit. I would, what, what gets tracked gets done. I would track how many applications you've offered. Why, why wouldn't you hold your front office person to that, to that number? That's how you, as a, I mean, how do you know? You're sitting in the chair in the back. How do you know? So track that because, it, again, you cannot discriminate and, and your case acceptance will go up just simply offering it to every single person. Um, then you got the in-house financing. Now this is the risky one to some people, right? So some people do three months, you know, in-house. Oh, I know that patient, they've been coming in for years. Let's give them three months and that, you know, that'll send them my accounts receivables for a while. But that's at your own risk, number one. They might not pay you, they probably will. But the other part of that is, is three months does nothing, you guys. If someone has money problems, do you think dividing it up by three is going to really change the situation? I just gave you a statistic that those older Gen Xs, and notice I didn't say millennials or Xennials. I said Gen X. The older Gen Xs have no money, right? And, and dividing a, a $5,000 case up by three is like a big give by you, but that's not a big give to them. They don't have a thousand bucks. So I would look into companies like Verity. I, I, do, I do promote companies like Verity. Well, they'll actually uh, help you put a payment plan together. And, and Verity will actually come in and they will, if the patient fails to pay you, they'll actually give you the difference of that contract and go be your collection agency on that particular case. And there's no credit pulled. Um, I think it's only up to $2,500, but it's a, it's a hundred percent guarantee. So look at solutions like Verity where they can actually help you do safer in-house financing programs where they offset the loss and you can spread over payments over 12 to 18 months, which is way better than your three months. So hopefully that that's sticking. And then of course the wellness programs, I, I mean, Lumatrack, Clear, Dental Menu, all good companies. My, my preference is dental menu, but um, all great companies. And, and this is just to create stickiness with your patients, um, especially the patients that don't have insurance, the out of networks or, or, or what have you. And the great thing about that is these membership plans, people are okay with making payments, right? Like that's why you go into, you know, a cell phone, you know, AT, uh, AT&T, right? And they, they hit you up for a $700 phone, right? no one chooses that option right everybody chooses the monthly payment option people want payments the gen xers the millennials the Xennials, they all want payments so why not incorporate that into your 
office doing your recare and giving them maybe a discount on the big restorative by being a part of that membership, it creates stickiness. I did a post on Instagram and Facebook about how I'm a big Costco loyalty guy, right? I'm a big Alaska airline loyalty guy. Um, Starbucks, we all have the Starbucks app. These are all membership. Why are they doing it? To create stickiness with you. Why wouldn't you do that, right? So, so again, create, create those membership opportunities in your office. Um, and then, honestly, I'm going to end with this, I think. Just kind of working through like the waterfall of how this really could impact your office. Okay, let me just throw out an example. Got 25 patients a day, fairly big office, but kind of that medium size office. 25 patients come in. Of that 25, 10 will be hygiene, 15 will be restorative, okay? By the numbers, by the numbers. Of that 15 uh, that, that, that it came in for restorative, back to my Percentage is 40% say yes, no question, I got it. Hopefully with digital imaging, we can get some of those, you know, that percentage higher. But just by the numbers, that the 60% the of 15 is nine. And they're at no maybe, okay? So of those no maybe, back to my last slide, I said 20%, that small slice was 20%. People don't know how they're gonna pay, remember? So of that nine, 20% don't know how they're gonna pay, but in this slide, or this, this one, I'm saying 80% do know how they're gonna pay. Insurance, cash, credit. But that other 20%, they don't know. And just by offering some of these in-house payment plans, you could get that one patient every day to say yes. And if you build in on, on average what, what one patient times 188 days of, of work, uh, I forget what case I use, but that gives this particular office a lift of $100,000. I mean, just by offering every patient more options financially. Um, it, it, it works just like that. Again, it's all about that funnel. You know, you, you, you were trying to close more deals. Sorry, it sounds bad, but it's the truth. Just offering more people. And, you know, I'm saying close, right? But but what I, mean, what I really mean by sell and close, it sounds harsh, but no, what I really mean is giving people more options to say yes so they can take care of themselves. You guys aren't prescribing stuff they don't need. These people need it, right? And they need to take better care of themselves. And it's your job as the provider to not only communicate well, show them on their seventh grade reading level, I'm not being a jerk, but just in general, show them through technology, have good communication skills, find out what's most important to them, give them great financial arrangements. I guarantee you your 40% goes to 50, maybe 60% by just checking off some of these simple things. So again, it's not all about volume. Pre-COVID, you know, we had all these patients, not a worry in the world. COVID comes, we're all sidelined. COVID now gets lifted. And now we're thinking, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, right? But, you know, let's be really efficient with that hour in your chair and get more people to say yes. And, and I promise your revenue will go up just by being, uh, you know, just by, by doing some of these things, just be, just be super intentional with every patient you get. And that's my challenge to you. So, um, so that's that guys. Uh, I think, I think, I think now that kind of tees up Dr. Young now to kind of bring, bring, it, bring it home as far as, you know, what he's doing with, with his process um, and, and hopefully can give you some tips on how to, uh, you know, incorporate some of the things he's doing to get patients to say yes and identify, uh, identify more, more opportunity. So because I'm a man, I can't, I can't multitask. So I'm literally switching my host over to Dr. Young, that's what we're doing over here. Um, but I think you have the controls, uh, sir. And uh, I think the, the show's yours, but um, thank, thank you again. And, and then we'll wrap this up with Q&A with Troy after Troy's presentation. So thanks again. Yeah, thank you. So I'm sitting here realizing that maybe these uh, webinars are not good for me or I gotta get different glasses. These progressive, I'm looking like this all the time. Well, my neck's hurting. I'm just older than you guys or something. Anyway, 
it's it's Michigan, Doctor. I, I'm an Ohio State guy. Um, it's Michigan. It's something with Michigan, I think. Uh, you mean the eyes? The eyesight? I don't know. I'm going to try to move this to the bottom. All right. So uh, thank you, Dr. Young. I appreciate the uh, invite to share with you tonight. Uh, I'm going to show you my 3D dentistry roadmap, the paradigm shifts I've encountered along the way, and how what I call the digital dentistry puzzle, and how I put that together in my practice and how it can help you now in this time of recovery, and then hopefully long after this pandemic is over. So tonight I'm gonna to talk about, a little fast there, sorry. I'm gonna talk about 2D and 3D imaging and whether it's time for a paradigm shift and how we use that technology in our offices. I'm gonna go over intraoral scanning and CAD CAM workflows. And I'm gonna show you a, an all digital implant workflow that saves you a ton of money uh, and cuts down on the overhead uh, and the cost of doing business with implants. I've actually been able to lower my fees, believe it or not. First, a little bit about me. This is for you, Michael. Um, 1994, University of Michigan grad, private practice in Sterling Heights, Michigan. Um, an ADA member, I believe in organized dentistry. I was a, a trustee for the Michigan Dental Association for six years. Uh, I'm a mentor for the uh, Coyce Center um, in Seattle. That's John Coyce there and two of my really good friends, Jay Lopez and Brian Nakagawa. They're uh, Jay's a dentist in, in Tucson and Brian's a dentist in Oregon. Um, hang on, there we go. Doesn't wanna move, I, I missed my mouse, that's what happens. So I'm also a sometime triathlete. Uh, I saw Troy that you like to cycle. Um, this picture over here is uh, some of my good friends. We, we raise money for, uh, to find a cure against blood cancers. Uh, and this picture in the top middle there, that's what we call the party of eight. This is my blended family. This is a, a second marriage for me. My wife, Cheryl, she has three kids. Uh, I've got two girls and a boy. She's got uh, two boys and a girl. And uh, now all of a sudden in like one year, we've got half of them in college. So things are changing rapidly around here. Unfortunately, I had a senior this year um, at a very inopportune time. So there you go, Michael. I got both schools, both Big Ten schools in the state covered. I, I'm really not a Michigan guy. I'm a Michigan State guy. Um, Just so you know, Doc, uh, I, I noticed an attendee in the audience that is also a Michigan uh, alum alumni. So you, I, I think I'm over. I think you guys outweigh me right now. So, well, I, I like to say that because I went to both schools, I actually know which one's better. Um, and then usually people don't really know what to say to that. So. Um, full disclosure, I'm on the Plan Mecca Board of Education, and I'm also a KOL, and I, I think it's important to know that um, I've had all the equipment I've had before I became a KOL. I actually asked how I could help um, because I believe in the technology. I, I know it makes me a better dentist every day. You want to you want to become a better dentist? Look at your preps on a screen blown up and try to mark the margin. You become a better dentist. So I believe in the technology, I believe what it does for my patients, and I believe what it does for my practice, and I really just want to share it. So where have I been? My little digital dentistry GPS. Um, this is my mentor, John Coyce there. Again, my buddy's up in the upper right, and then his teaching center right in Lake Union in downtown Seattle. And what John said to me a long time ago, and said in class actually, is removal of tooth structure has a consequence. Is shown by this study, effective prepared cavities on the strength of teeth. Okay, what they did was they looked at the force required to fracture a tooth that was clean, no cavity, no filling, nothing. And then they, they measured what happens when you have a filling that takes up just one fourth of the intercuspal distance uh, and an MOD. And then what happens if that filling doesn't involve the interproximal surfaces, it's just the occlusal. This is very interesting. Um, it's really the same. It doesn't matter where the mesial and distal are involved at all. And then if the filling gets a little bit bigger, it's now one third of the intercuspal distance. It's now less than half the original strength to break this tooth. And again, it doesn't matter whether it's an occlusal only or an MOD or an MO or a DO. So when I have a very large filling and it's just the occlusal surface, I make sure I take an intraoral photo 
And if I get it rejected, I send them this study and I get, they take care of it, they pay it. So what we're trying to really do is keep our patients from getting here. Because if you imagine now you take out the silver filling there in the middle, you really only have a very little amount of the tooth structure on the outside there. And then if you're gonna crown that, now you're removing even more tooth. So now you need a root canal post and you're really relying on that post to take a lot of force. And you know, maybe an implant is better in this situation. So uh, we're looking at risk and minimizing that risk. So this is what John Coyce inspired me to do. Um, this is a, a, a preparation. You can see that um, very minimal occlusal reduction. Beyond that, no prep down on the axial wall. I remove the existing restoration. I break the contacts and I blend it all together. And then here's what it looks like from the occlusal. I've got a very nice enamel ring for predictable bonding. The question now though is, how do we place a temporary restoration on this prep? One that stays on, but is easy to get off. And then when you take it off, it doesn't in any way alter the preparation so that your restoration seats. So the light bulb kind of goes on and the answer is pretty obvious. This is the reason I got into CAD CAM dentistry back in 2004. I, I wanted to remove as little tooth as possible. And because we had the materials in, we didn't have to bury every prep below the gum line to hide metal anymore. We had ceramics. So there's the result. I think that's gorgeous. That's an Empress multi-CAD block uh, bonded into place. Nobody can really see that. I think it's a beautiful. And, and so what we've done is we've put the risk on the material instead of the tooth. So if this patient comes in and the restoration is fractured, I can live with that. But if we're ending up like that other picture where the lingual cusp is entirely gone and we have a filling there and, and really very little of the tooth left, uh, that I, I don't want to live with that as much. So the success rate for this is great, almost 80% even after 20 years. And as you can see, the highest, the biggest reason why they fail is because they fracture. And some of that is operator error. So also along my little curve there, uh, my winding road, I had to upgrade to the blue cam. I uh, got the uh, furnace from Ivoclar so I could make Emacs restorations. My milling unit uh, had a $6,000 repair and then something else broke down. So I ended up getting the MCXL. In 2013, I had Omnicam in my office for about a month. And we don't really have time to go into all the reasons why I switched. But at that particular point, I jumped off and I went with E4D. I had the cart for about one month with the full understanding that the Nevo uh, scanner and the laptop was coming out. They gave me the, the laptop. I actually bought an additional laptop for $5,000 so I could jump from room to room. Somewhere along the line, I believe there was an issue with the cord on the scanner. And uh, rather than repairing or sending me another Nevo, they sent me a brand new plan scan scanner. And this is the kind of thing that if you want stickiness, as Michael said, that's great support. There were no questions. They overnighted me a new scanner. It was there by eight o'clock in the morning the next day. Um, in 2015, I upgraded my Plan Mecca Pro Max Pansep to 3D. And at the end of 2017, uh, this, these two, the combination of a 3D printer, I got the Formlabs 2, and the new Emerald Scanner really changed my practice. And I really had no idea until I had the uh, ability to 3D print in my office the things I could do. So a little while later, um, I upgrade the scanner this last fall to the S. The Emerald Scanner is fantastic, but the S is amazing. This is wicked fast, very accurate. I took my um, Formlabs 2 home during quarantine to do some printing, had a sensor error dealt with support. Basically, my Formlabs 2 died during the quarantine and they offered uh, a new one for only $800. I sat on it and thought for a while and I decided I was going to make a total change. I was going to change the technology from the SLA to the DLP, which is a little bit faster, and I got a Sprint Ray Pro. So this is what I'm calling right now my digital, digital dentistry puzzle. And I think you should know that the two uh, parts on the bottom, the E4D, that's my original E4D mill that I got in 2013. If you take care of these machines, they will treat you very well. That thing is a beast. 
uh, and it's much quieter than its uh, counterpart from that other company. And the Pansef, I bought a floor model from Patterson in 2006, and that thing is still humming along. So where are we going though? And this is, this is really important. So if you don't know where you're going, you might wind up somewhere else, right? So dentistry, the dentists participate on average with about six dental benefit plans. But the composition of those plans is changing as 80% of them now are PPOs. And those networks, through their language on their EOBs that they're sending to patients, are trying to steer those patients to a PPO dentist. In turn, patients are now also bearing a bigger burden of the cost. And dentist reimbursements are not going up. They're staying low. And because patients are dealing with higher cost, they're more likely to leave. They're practicing consumerism. So now we got the dentist here. All uh, reimbursement levels are dropping to PPO levels and they're gonna stay there for a while. And so the dentist really needs to be efficient. We've gotta control our cost and we've gotta increase our production. In addition, we've got disruption. We've got clinics that have been owned by dentists that are now being owned by corporations. So they've got more buying power, more management experience, strategic investment, marketing budget. You simply can't outspend these companies in a marketing budget. And now we have this. We got punched in the mouth, right? Nobody figured something like this was coming. So with all the things that are going on, you've got choices. You can get out. I guarantee you some dentists are just not coming back or they're going to try it for a few months and they're going to get out. Some may want to sell to a DSO and work for them for a while. Me, I'm going to suggest the way to compete now and the way to stay active is to differentiate yourself. Our problem has changed. So I sat home for 10 weeks and then I spent a bunch of money trying to figure out how I was gonna get back, determine the best way to move forward with my team, protect them and myself and my patients. And then some people are just facing a dead end. I'm curious now, and I'm not sure which way it is, if the DSOs are gonna be buying practices now or if they're getting out because they see the risk. These private equity firms care about the bottom line. So this is 2020. I was supposed to take my daughter on her senior spring break. I was supposed to watch her play soccer. One last year, she's captain of her team. They have 12 returning seniors, a team that had been in the final four the last two years. And I was supposed to be working to save money for two kids in college. Yet, you know what? Those things are kind of hard, but they're not nearly as hard as what some families had to do. So I have to temper my complaining and, and put it in perspective. So here we are, All right? Now, this may not be all of you, may not be any of you, but you know, are you the one moving forward, getting your pants pulled down, or are you the one hanging on for dear life? You gotta ask yourself, how are you gonna save money? How are you gonna make money? You need a plan. As Michael said, what you track, okay, what you measure improves. So this is your roadmap to recovery. Step one. All right, we're going to talk about intraoral scanning and CAD CAM dentistry. So this formula right here, this is from Dental Intel. Production equals the number of visits times production per visit, right? It's very simple. We need to maximize our visits and produce as much as we possibly can each and every time right now. PPE is scarce and it's expensive. We need to maximize how we're using it. In addition, you know, some, some patients are not coming back right now. They want to wait a little bit longer. And then some of us are spreading out patients a little bit to kind of facilitate disinfection. Maybe we don't have enough operatories. So we're putting a gap between patients and we're sp spacing them out. For the first month I was back, I staggered appointments. And we st in the summer, we start like at 7.30 in the morning. So we would go 7.20, 7.30, 7.40. And then we put a 10-minute gap between every patient. You know what that did? That increased my overhead. 
And that's what's happening to all of us. So we have to produce as much as we can every visit. And I'm going to propose to you that one of the biggest differences you can make right off the bat is the same visit restoration. So this is my friend, Clint Stevens, Dr. Stevens in Oklahoma. I laughed when I heard him say this, and it's so true. The only thing your patient hates more than seeing you once is seeing you twice. They don't want to come back. So for the patient, it's no second injection. It's not having to take off work, not having to get a babysitter, not having to come back a second day. They don't have to worry about a temporary that's going to fall off. And for the office, there's no second injection. There's no second appointment. There's no interruption in your schedule to put the temporary crown back on. I used to hate that when I'd see, you know, an addition to the schedule. The girls wear Motorola headsets and I can hear them. Oh, we got an add on. And I'm like, you know, you look and it's, it's re cement temp. So if we're going to look at break even on a full system, financial indifference, how many crowns do you need to do a month, CAD CAM, to break even? So if your fee for an Emax or zirconia, whatever you want to do, if your fee for a crown at the lab is $119 and you finance this machine, it's 20 crowns a month, okay? And flat out, I'll tell you, if you're not doing 20 crowns a month, don't add the stress on by getting the milling unit. But a lot of offices are doing 20 crowns a month. And if you're not, we got to figure out why. I'm going to show you a workflow in a little bit, an all digital implant workflow, that if you did this just twice a month, and you don't even have to place the implant, you can just restore two implants a month. If you do it this way, you're going to save big money each time, and you only actually need to, to mill 14 crowns a month. So there's a little bit of pressure taken off. So one of the most important things. I had a, a dentist friend who was in his late 50s and decided to go back to Notre Dame to get his executive MBA. He paid $88,000 for an executive MBA at 58 years old. He sent me a spreadsheet, a time value money equation that showed me how I was losing money by doing CAD CAM dentistry. The problem was he got all the variables wrong. But what I learned is you can't increase your fees enough, okay? You can't do enough crowns to make it financially indifferent. And you can't find a lab with a lower fee and you put it in the calculation to make the difference. You know what makes the difference? The only thing that makes a difference is the time the doctor spends chair side with the patient. If the doctor's gonna get a CAD CAM system and they're gonna sit there and play with this for 90 minutes or 120 minutes and they're not gonna delegate it, then that's a way to lose money. So this is what a great schedule would look like, um, you know, over five operatories, two hygiene and, and three for the doctor. In this particular example, the doctor units are blue. Now in my state, hygienists can numb patients. So if in your state, they can numb patients, you might have them numb the patient. Uh, my friend pays his hygienist $10 for every injection they get, and they're pretty motivated. Another thing you could do is you could use buffered anesthetic. Personally, in my office, I use On Pharma. If I'm doing a block, the patients are numb in two minutes. And if they're not, I'm re-injecting, and it works every single time. So because we have a plug-and-play USB scanner, we can be an operatory one. I can prep. Sometimes it takes, you know, longer, right? Not every tooth, not every person is easy to work on. So we give 20 minutes for me to do all that. I leave the room. The assistant takes over. I use... Uh, RDAs in my office, so legally they can pack cord in my in my state. They they pack the cord, they scan, they design, and they put it in the milling unit. While they're doing that, I'm going over to the next room. I can literally take the scanner, unplug it, and plug it into the into. The, I don't even have to have a laptop from Plan Mecca. I can just plug it into the computer in the room if the computer's good enough. And then we work there. This is the way to be financially indifferent. When I first started, for a long time, I was scared to do anterior teeth. And then I just got braver over time. This is a young lady. This is an intraoral camera photo. She did not like the way number seven was rotated. And again, photo with the intraoral camera, not as great. This is the photo with the DSLR. I think that's beautiful. That's one visit. I stained it myself. I customize it. I didn't have to pay. I had a very expensive lab in Seattle. I would spend over $400 to get that crown done before. And if you just spend the time learning it, you can do it. Here's another case. This is a young lady who unfortunately knocked out her tooth on the playground and uh, evulsed. So we put it back in 
and I believe she's about high school age now, and she's going to lose the tooth. We've got some resorption that we're dealing with, but we're trying to hang on to it as long as we can to maintain the bone for the time to come to be able to place an implant. But she hated the way the tooth looked, and I'm, I'm not a very good marketer, too stupid to take a picture beforehand, or I was in a rush or whatever. So I, I took it here of the prep, and you can see the stump shade is dark. But this is the result. I think that's pretty sweet to do that in one visit for somebody. No temporary, no $400 lab fee. So the Emerald S scanner, very fast scanning, less than one minute for full arch, depending on what you're doing. You might need a little bit more information, take your time, do a little bit longer. No other system has import. So if you're looking for a scanner and you're looking for a system, not sure what happened there, sorry, disappeared. No other system has import, and that's a huge thing. You don't really realize it until you start to do more and more workflows. Import and export STL and color formats. It's plug and play, I already said. No cart that you gotta move around the office, it's in the way, no laptop lead needed. It's full frame color with shade assistant for shade matching, and all files are stored on your computer. And to me, that's a huge advantage. And there's also a curiosity tip for love that transillumination tip for enhanced carries detection. The bottom line here is if you're going to look at all the scanners on the market, I want you to look at five-year cost. Okay. They're not going to tell you, they're not going to add up all the fees, okay, all the support, all the consumables, what it really costs over a five-year period. And you also have to consider the warranty and the support. Plan Mecca Emerald S has incredible value. So this is the two tips. On the left is the slim line. This is the smallest autoclavable tip on the market. Um, I, the one on the right there is the regular scan, uh, regular tip. I, if I'm gonna do a full arch scan, which by the way, I couldn't do until I got the emerald. And now it's very easy. My assistants used to give me the stink eye if I asked them, or worse, to do a full arch scan with a plan scan. Now they don't hesitate, they jump right in and do it. So the majority of the scan is done with this tip right here. And then if, to get into some of the nooks and crannies in the second molars, we use a slimline tip. So this is a great view here in the middle. It shows the difference. And look at this right here. You got somebody that won't open their mouth, right? They're either, they're either unwilling or they're unable, right? You need that to get back there. It's an incredible tip. Those tips are, I believe, 300 or 350, whatever, 300, and they last 250 to 350 uses. So it's basically a dollar a use is the way I like to calculate it. This is Lewis. Lewis is a very large man. He is very scared. When he was in the room, he was not sitting in the chair when I came in the room. He was standing up. And he was so tall, he, his head was as tall as the monitor on the ceiling. And eventually Lewis gets into the chair and I look in his mouth and number nine is cracked. And I say, holy crap, how long have you been walking around like that? And he tells me about three years. And most patients crack a tooth like that, they're in right away. But Lewis is so afraid, his, his fear of the dentist is higher than his, you know, than his pain threshold. So now what are you gonna do? Are you gonna take a PVS impression? What's gonna happen if you, if you do that? Are you gonna pull some of the tooth out? I don't know, I don't wanna take that chance. Um, what if you have a digital scanner? You can scan the tooth right where it is in its place without disrupting anything. And then what if you have a 3D printer? So because the this, this system is open, I export the scan and put it in a third party software where I make a model, I make a base, I print it. Here's the printed model. Here's the vacuform suck down. I don't think this picture is day of extraction. I, I took one later for purposes of demonstration. But here it is, the day we extract the tooth. Sorry, there's a little bit of blood in there. So this I got done in two days. I didn't have to send it out for a week. There's nothing covering, there's no flipper covering the palate. If he loses it or damages it, I can easily make him another one. Here's a night guard in a third party software because I also, because I can export the files. I can design a night guard, 3D print a night guard. I was paying probably too much for my night guards, but I was having a guy in Tennessee do them. It took about a week. They came back and they were dead on. I never had to adjust them, but $117 and about a month to get it done. 
Now I can do this in a few days. And this is exactly the way I want it. I want a, a contact on the centrals. I want canine, canine, and first molar. It's balanced left to right, front to back, minimal chance for interference. If a patient breaks one, I print another one. It costs me less than $5 to print a night guard. Here's the same software using to make a, uh, a deprogrammer. Here's the printed deprogrammer. Here it is in the mouth. I had sent, I had a, a lab do one of these for me before. And then uh, I 3D printed this one for him. He likes the one I made for him better. And there it is in place. So I, I could go on and on and I could show you a bunch of cases and a bunch of you know workflows and how to do this and how to do that. You know, we don't have the time in, in this format, but the, the first step is to produce more per visit. You gotta increase your efficiency and you gotta decrease your overhead. And an intraoral scanner and a milling unit are great ways to do that. So the next step. So is, the, is Prince William telling the media what he said to his brother and sister-in-law, right? He's not, he's saying, I got three kids. And I can tell you, I know firsthand what that's like. That's a whole new ball game. You gotta have a bigger vehicle. You gotta have three rows of seating. You have to sit at bigger tables and restaurants. So many things you just don't think about. So just beware people, if you, if you have two, the next one is a big jump. So this is what we see. What if you only have the first few, right? You're gonna miss out on the truth. And that in a nutshell is 2D versus 3D, right? So in this image, do you have a square or do you have a circle? Is it either? Well, depending on your vantage, what if you had a 360 degree view? It's a cylinder, right? How many times as a dentist have you diagnosed your patient as a square or a circle when really it was a cylinder? So the problem with 2D radiography is the superimpo uh, superimposition of overlying structures, right? We're taking a 3D person and we're smashing it flat into 2D. So we've lost spatial information, especially buccolingually. You can see mesial distally, apical, corona apical coronally, but you've lost that buccolingual dimension. We've known since 1961, okay? For decades, we've known. This study was in 61. It was republished in the 90s, I think, in the Journal of Endodontics. So lesions in cortical bones, says right in here, can be detected radiographically only if there's a perforation of the bone cortex, erosion from the inner surface of the bone cortex, or extensive erosion or destruction from the outer surface. Lesions in cancellous bone cannot be detected on an x-ray. Extensive disease of bone, therefore, may be present when there's no evidence of it on, an, on a radiograph, right? But yet this is the gold standard in diagnosis. And when you finish your root canal and you send it to Delta Dental and they tell you you didn't do it right, or you overfilled or you underfilled, you, they're judging you on a 2D x-ray, which in many cases is just not accurate. So here's a study done in, in two, or published in 2009 by Patel. And what they wanted to do was look at periapical bone defects uh, using cone beam and comparing it to intraoral PAs, right? So they, they took mandibular first molars and they sectioned them through the furcation into mesial and distal roots. And the distal root was then extracted. They put it back in and they took baseline x-rays with PAs with a sensor, a digital sensor, and cone beam. And then the distal root was taken out, removed again, and they made a little spherical lesion in the bone of two millimeters by, by drilling a hole in the cancellous bone. They put the root back in, then they took pictures with the PA and the cone beam again. Then they removed the root one more time and then they made the lesions four millimeters, okay? And these are the results. The PA, was only able to see 25% of those lesions, while the cone beam was able to see 100% of the lesions. Here's another study. They're looking at, the purpose of this study was to compare the prevalence of periapical lesions on individual roots using PAs and cone beam, right? And these teeth were already treatment planned for endo. So 2D PAs and cone beam scans were taken of 151 teeth and 273 roots. With the PA, they found lesions on 55% of the roots, but the cone beam identified 130. So what about the absence of pathology? In the 2D, 
they found an absence, absence of anything on 218 of the roots, but the cone beam was 143. So the bottom line, if, if you're doing endo and you're using two DPAs, you're missing out. You're either not diagnosing or you're misdiagnosing. So this study here, 2017, cone beam, 3D cone beam imaging is twice as capable of detecting periapical lesions compared to 2D. And the advantage to 3D is even greater in the maxilla where it's two and a half times more accurate, simply because we can look at each individual root, right? And we don't have the hindrance of anatomical superimposition. So you can look, at, I can show you study after study after study that basically says the same thing. And, and if you think about it, it's common sense. Still, okay, while cone beam solves the loss of spatial information inherent with 2D imaging, and is widely used in a lot of applications today, there are concerns about radiation exposure. There's, there's a considerable range of exposure with different machines. Everybody's coming out with a machine, right? And some of these high ranges approach the exposure of medical CT. And it's been estimated that CT, uh, that one and a half to 2% of all cancers are related to CT imaging. So this paper, along with some others, all right, and some of these, you want to look at the dates on some of these papers. This is 2014. It suggests that cone beam must not be routinely used for, for dental diagnosis or for screening purposes. And it should only be used when a 2D radiograph is diagnostic. But there's already the rub. We already know they're not diagnostic. So here is a huge meta-analysis that Ludlow and his posse there did. And they looked at adult effective doses and child effective doses with large field of view. There's the range, that's a, that's a wide range of exposures. Medium field of view, small field of view, okay? So big differences between different units, additional low dose and some high definition protocols for some units are extending that range of, do of doses. Now let's look at the mean, okay? The mean adult effective dose for a large field of view is 212 microsieverts, and for the child, it's 175. Now the medium in, in all these studies, they combine medium and large field of view for, the, for children. That's why you're not seeing anything there. In the small field of view, the mean adult effective dose is 84 microsieverts, and for the child, 103. And then these are ranges for CT imaging. So I don't have those numbers on this screen, but some of those high numbers fall in the range of CT. So that's a problem. The use of cone beam, this is the advisory statement from the ADA Council on Scientific Affairs back in 2012, okay? And I hate to read slides, I know it's boring, but we're, we're kind of building a case here, okay? They said that clinicians should perform radiographic imaging, including cone beam, only after we can justify the need for the x-ray. All examinations should be indicated clinically and justified appropriately. A lot of common sense we have to deal with here. So then the, they said the clinician should prescribe to traditional dental radiographs and cone beam scans only when he or she expects that the diagnostic yield will benefit patient care. So if, it, if it's not gonna change your care, don't take the image is what they're saying. And then now they address cone beam. They should, it could be considered or should be considered as an adjunct to standard oral imaging modalities. CBCT may supplement or replace dental radiography for the diagnosis, right? And if you look at the bottom, when they say your conventional radiography is not gonna capture the image, but we've already shown that it's not. And they want you to limit the radiation dose by optimizing image quality, using the smallest field of view necessary, right? using a, a very small field of view, using the lowest combination of tube output and scan time consistent with adequate image noise content and motion artifact, blah, blah, blah. So this is the ALAR principle. Basically, that's what the ADA Council on Scientific Affairs was telling you to do. They're telling you to follow the ALAR principle as low as reasonably achievable, right? But now that we've had every company come out with their machine and they're really not giving very good direction for keeping doses low and having such a wide range. And the other problem is us dentists, we like pretty pictures, right? So 
uh, we're asking for high definition uh, imaging if we refer it to a specialist, if you don't have a comb beam in your office, when it's really not appropriate. And because of this, um, they've changed our LARA to a LADA. So we've got to be, be mindful. You don't need a high exposure image to get a diagnosis. And so this study here by Ludlow and Coivisto, this is the game changer right here. Basically repeating, but this is the backstory of their study. They say the range of doses produced by dental comb beam units is large, with some examinations approaching doses associated with medical CT. I've already told you this, estimated between one and a half to two percent of all U.S. cancers may be attributed to CT. And the dosimetry of comb beam examinations for pediatric patients has not been established. That's the problem. There's no established guidelines. So what they did in this study, the purpose was to evaluate doses from different combinations of field size and exposure parameters on child and adult phantoms using a Planmeca Promax 3D mid comb beam unit. Okay. And the second purpose was to, and I'm going to use some fancy terms because this is what they say, to acquire contrast noise ratio data and modulation transfer function, in case some of you are geeks, to examine the relationship of these measures of image quality to, to dose. So they want to know if there's a loss of quality in these images using different doses. And they're using doses that you might use in orthodontics. And they use Plan Mecca's proprietary reconstruction ultra low dose technology versus standard protocols. And this is what they found. An average reduction in dose of 77% was achieved using ultra low dose protocols when compared with standard. They found no statistical reduction in image quality between ultra low dose and standard protocols. And this suggests that patient doses can be reduced without loss of diagnostic quality. So this is the absolute game changer, right? Now we can take image, we can use comb beam, we're able to provide a diagnosis compared to the 2D, right? And we're also giving a lower dose. So if you look at these images here, on the left half of the screen, those are both low resolution. One is low and one is ultra dose, ultra low dose. You can't see a difference. On the right side of the screen, the resolution is normal on the top and it's ultra low dose, normal on the bottom. No difference. On the left side of the screen here, we got high definition and then high definition ultra low dose. And on the right side, very high resolution for endo, right? We're trying to see if we have a crack in a root. There's no difference between the ultra low dose. And matter of fact, some argue that they think the ultra low dose actually is a better image. Here's another study also done by Ludlow. And you can look at the introduction there. Um, it's basically, they're worried about long-term exposure of x-rays, right? And the industry response has been to offer low exposure alternatives, right? Now, everybody's starting to promise that they have an ultra low dose option. All right, so what they did was they compared high resolution standard and low resolution scans that they called quick scan and quick scan plus. In order to achieve the lower dose with this machine, they reduced the image rotation in half. So they took 73% less images. They also lowered the KVP and the time of the scan. So the machine is moving faster, thus the quick scan name. And there isn't enough time to take the same amount of frames. So there's missing information, okay, which the conclusion noted. Quick scan, are, the quick scan is similar to a pan, but it's got significant reductions in the image quality, okay? Look at the, I've got a little video here that's going to demonstrate that. So as we move through the slices, you're gonna see gaps. There's no information there. So yeah, they lowered the, the dose, but how, how did they do it? So when company A or company B comes to you um, and they're gonna to try to, to sell you their machine instead of the Plan Mecca option, they're gonna say, yeah, we have ultra low dose, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna beg you to ask to see the images Okay, so that you can compare them. And I, I want you to ask for the numbers. And if they can give you numbers, that's one thing. I don't, a lot of companies will not share their exposure. 
And then you want to, you just basically want to know how you got it because they're going to tell you one thing to sell you a machine. But we talked about sales, right? So let's look at, we're all in sales. I'm in sales. Um, but I don't sell plan Mac equipment, but I believe in it. Um, this is just a little chart of different exposures that, that people get. And I have, I've highlighted two here. Um, the, the green one is what I'm calling a 3D PA. It's a five by five, very limited field of view, ultra low dose, low resolution. That has a, an exposure to the patient of three microsieverts. A digital PA with a sensor, 10. All right, now an eight by eight, also ultra low dose, low resolution. I have a, a, a classic in my office. It has a very limited field of view. Uh, I'm gonna suggest that many people would like a, a bigger field of view and whatever you think you're gonna be doing, get that field of view right off the beginning. Me personally, I've been pretty happy with my eight by eight. Comparing it to a pan, it's 55% less exposure. And then the digital FMX, it's a lot less. Right, and then we already know with that digital FMX, you've lost a ton of information. You can't make a diagnosis anyway. So now we've got Mrs. Jones, right? We're gonna walk through the office workflow. She's gonna to go to a 2D practice and she's gonna get an FMX, right? By the way, that's my mom. Look at, she had a lot of dentistry done. And a pan. So you're gonna have an exposure of 20 or 171. And if you do a pan, you're gonna take four bite wings, right? So your range in the 2D practice is 44 to 171 microsieverts. Now, Mrs. Jones is gonna to go to a Plan Mecca 3D ultra low dose practice. And you have the option, you could take an eight by eight ultra low dose, low resolution, right? And you have the option of taking extra oil bite wings. Now those extra oil bite wings, that's sweet. I mean, look at all the information you're getting on there way more information than regular bite wings. But if you prefer to take the interorals, you now have a range of 13 to 33. What about Mrs. Jones? Now, obviously not the same Mrs. Jones. I have a lot of Mrs. Jones in my practice, apparently. This isn't Mrs. Jones, actually, this is Dan. And I'm gonna tell you a story about Dan because this is a humbling experience. This is the truth, okay? And we have, you know, one of the things I like about Dr. Kois is he'll show you his failures, all right? People that never show their failures, I don't believe them, all right? I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you my, my real experience. So Dan comes in in 2017, he puts his finger in his mouth and he taps on 29, he says it hurts to chew on this too. So we take this PA, okay? And we check the bite, we do some cold testing, blah, blah, blah. We, we say, Dan, I think it's the bite. Let me know if it doesn't get better. We adjust it, we send him on his way. He comes back in 2019, he says, Doc, this tooth is still bothering me. And not only that, he points to number three. This one also hurts to chew on. So for whatever reason, don't know why, can't really explain it, we did not take a PA. Now, also remember now, I've had cone beam, ultra low dose in my office, since 2015. We take a look at the tooth, we can't find anything wrong, I send Dan away. Dan comes back in in January of 2020 and he's, Dan is a little um, in your face kind of guy. He's very direct, he doesn't beat around the bush, right? He says, doc, I feel like I'm going crazy. I know there's something wrong with these teeth. I can't chew on them. He said, I went and got a second opinion. I said, you did. I said, why'd you, why, why'd you do that? He said, because I thought you were full of shit. So my patient told me, he didn't believe me, he didn't trust me, he knows there's something wrong with these teeth and I'm not finding the answer that he's looking for. All right, so here is, we finally take the, the comb beam. Look at, look at this, that's a significant lesion down here. So, I do the root canal on 29. Dan comes back two weeks later and he's ready to hug me. And he says, I love you, man. And I said, oh, really? He said, yeah, the, the pain is gone. And then we did the endo on three, which we also found on the cone beam. So you might also notice that I didn't even get the full apex on that PA. 
it, you know, the tooth was too long. I didn't ask for a second PA. And I have no idea why I didn't take a 3D image earlier. It's my paradigm shift, right? It's my learning curve. Here's a patient comes in, pain in the upper right, around number, number three there. This is what it looks like. Pretty well delineated lesion there. Didn't look like that on the other x-ray, right? Here's your coronal view. Here's your apical view. There's a hole in the buccal plate. All right, and we know from the Bender and Seltzer study from 1961 that we can't see that until it's pretty extensive. And this is what it looks like. I would have never guessed that there was a hole in the buccal plate by looking at that 2D PA. Now here's another case. Uh, you can see it's pretty evident that 13's got a problem, but it also looks like maybe 14's kind of, the mesial root there may be affected. Now, anytime I have an endo failure, this was not my endo, but if it was my endo, it doesn't matter. If I have a failure, I'm gonna to refer to an endodontist because I know, you know, there could be a crack, the odds of it being, uh, the prognosis is, is not as good as doing it the first time, right? So I would have referred that out. But I wanted to see what the mesial looked like. And so I want you to, to see that, that there's a missed root right there on 13. That's why the endo failed. So now I get to do the root canal because I know why it failed, right? And then look at 14 over here. Those little flashes, those are images. You can take a, a still shot of a slice. So look, look at that, that's pretty extensive up there. Anyway, I get to do the root canal now. And you know what? I get to do the root canal 14 because I have a cone beam, ultra low dose. So I took some lumps, I learned. And then, you know, once I learned, then it was uh, getting the assistance and the hygienist on board and getting into the habit of, you know, not just automatically taking a PA. You know, they bring the emergency patient back, they do some investigating and they automatically take a PA and they come get you. Well, now they don't do that anymore. They just take them over and we do a limited exam, five by five, ultra low dose. This is old school Mario, right? This is your 2D PA. This is new school Mario. Now I want you to notice the hands. If you saw in the last image, the hands were skin colored. But because we now have such great technology, we have great 3D technology, he can wear white gloves now and we can actually see them. If those were 2D, those gloves would blend right into the screen. This is Bob and Bob moved. All of these things in there are movement. So we have an image that we can't use. And this is a big problem, right? There are studies that say patients move approximately 20% of the time. And then there's other studies where they're using an image artifact recognition to define patient movement. They're saying it's as high as 41 and a half percent. And if your patient is moving, you know, you don't really want to image them again, right? So Plan Mecca came up with an automatic patient movement correction. It's an algorithm and they call it calm. Let's watch a video. This is pretty impressive. We all have patients like this. Well, I hit my mouse too soon and it, it, uh, it, it all, uh, went off the last screen and went to the next slide. But I, d I just wanna say, um, that's amazing. I have several patients that have tremors uh, and you know, they can't hold still and that, that solves it. And then there's a lots of people, you know, they get a little anxious, they're a little bit uncomfortable in there. In 20 seconds, you know, they might have some movement and if they move at the wrong time, you've lost your, your chance for diagnosis. So unbelievable technology. I have that on all the time. It never goes off. So 
what, what I'm finding and what I hear doing some of these presentations and open houses and things like that is, you know, they'll ask me questions and always the, the first consideration is money, right? Do they want to invest the money in this technology? And then there's people who are afraid. Now they're going to be liable, right? I don't know how to read a scan. Uh, I don't know all that head and neck anatomy. I'm going to be liable if I miss something, you know, on an x-ray. Um, I'm going to say you're liable anyway. Because if, if you can't make a diagnosis and you don't refer them up the street to somebody who can with a, with a better imaging system, you know, you, you haven't diagnosed your patient. And I'm also going to say, um, you know, if you can't, is, is it better for the patient for you not to make a diagnosis? No, I mean, if you're, if you're worried about being able to read a scan, Plan Mecca, well, COVID kind of messed this all up, but had developed a two-day course on how to read scans. All right, we're gonna see what that looks like moving forward. I've seen a, a four hour course online, but you should not let that get in the way. You should be more afraid of not diagnosing your patient. And, and really the whole, I can't afford this technology, in my opinion, is just sort short sighted. I've already shown you a handful of cases now, and we're gonna go through some more. You are missing production. There are lesions walking out your door every day that the patient doesn't feel yet, and they're there. So you wanna talk about sales, cost benefits, return on investment. The, the machine I have, the classic, all right, if you finance it over five years, it's less than $1,600 a month. And I guarantee you that machine is gonna last way longer than five years. And the other really great thing is that Plan Mecca, most of the upgrades are software. You don't have to buy new hardware, it's software. So the truth is, all right, you can't afford not to have it. And again, I'm not a salesperson. I just use this. This benefits me every single week. So this case, almost $2,500 worth of production. This case, $3,200. This case, almost $2,800. 24. This one only wanted an extraction, right? 18 was extracted in this case. Not sure they want an implant, but maybe. So you can't treat what you can't diagnose, all right? And there's a lot of different ways to treat something, okay? But there can only be one accurate diagnosis. And if you're not accurately scanning that patient and getting the image you need, you're missing out, okay? Hugely important. This is a study or several studies on one screen here about incidental findings that people find on scans, all right? This first study, they looked at 1,000 scans, and on 943 of those scans, they found an incidental finding, okay? This happened to me the other day. We took an 8 by 8 3D image on a patient who was complaining on something on the left side, and guess what? Now we get to also treat the right side. They weren't having problems over there, but it looks just as bad as the left. In this study, almost 93% of the scans, they found an incidental finding, and on this study, almost 91. And you can find these on your own. They're out there. There's almost always something you're not expecting to find. So, you know, I always think about who's going to treat my kids and my family once I'm done practicing dentistry. Okay. So ask yourself if you're a dentist and, or you're not a dentist, but your, your spouse has a toothache, your kid has a toothache, right? Where do you want to send them? Do you want to send them that's got ultra low dose technology with calm? That's what I want to do, right? So step two of your recovery roadmap for today and beyond, diagnosis. You increase your case presentation and acceptance, which is what Michael talked about. When you show somebody an image, you know, a lot of people are visual learners, right? You know, you can talk to them, but it's, they're not really getting it. They need to see it. When you can show somebody the difference between that 2D and the 3D, when you can show them the hole in the bone, that's very powerful. So as your case acceptance goes up, your production increases and you decrease your overhead. Step three. So an all digital workflow from beginning to end, right? That's the reason why I got 3D in the first place was I wanted to plan implant placement and restoration. Diagnosing wasn't even really on my radar. And if it hasn't been on yours, I hope it is now with what you've seen. So this study published in 2016, 
They did a study on risk assessment for periimplantitis, showed nearly half of all the cases had been surgically triggered by implant malpositioning. So success of dental implants is highly dependent on correct position of the implant. This study in, 20, in 2004 said a correct 3D implant position has been pointed out as a pivotal factor for optimal aesthetic outcome. Now, this is a little hyperbole, right? But it gets the point across. What's this gonna look like when it's restored? So digital implant workflow. So if you take this image, right, I'm pretty happy. How many dentists, periodontists, oral surgeons have placed an implant there and sent the patient home? Well, here's the 3D image. The implant is out the buccal plate. How many times have we done that and not known it? So here's a study. In 2018, it was published. Randomized controlled study on the accuracy of free-handed, pilot drill guided, and fully guided implant surgery in partially edentulous patients. And what they wanted to measure was this apical global deviation over here with the three different techniques. And what they found is that the mean deviation in freehand was 2.1 millimeters, but the maximum was all the way up to almost five. In pilot guided, all right, it went down to 1.43 but the maximum was 2.72. In fully guided, the mean was less than one millimeter, and the maximum was 1.98. Here's another study, or this is the same guy who just did that study. Eunice, in 2014, he said, it's been shown that cement remnants are common around implants and may contribute to the development of periimplantitis. I don't know if you've ever had restored an implant that a periodontist or an oral surgeon that you work with, they place the implant and then they're calling you when the patient goes back there, you know, after a year to take a PA, check it out, see what it's, how it's going. They're calling you and they're blaming you for the implant inflammation around the implant saying you left cement there, right? 19.2% of the, imp I don't want that phone call, right? I'm going to show you how to eliminate it. 19.2% of the implants installed by mental navigation may be expected to receive a cement retained restoration. When you use pilot guided, it dropped all the way down to 4.2. But fully guided, 100% of the restorations were able to be screw retained. That's risk reduction. So here's a study. They wanted to measure implant positioning errors in freehand and computer-aided placement in fully edentulous patients. And what they found was, there's a probability of error when you're doing freehand, right? When you're placing that many implants, not guided in a fully edentulous case, 88% of the errors are gonna come from freehand and only 6% from computer-aided, right? It's a no-brainer. I can't see if you're laughing, but I'm, I think that's really funny. Anyway. So, I, I apologize. Um, another study, and we're going to get right to it here. Coronal deviation. Guided has the lowest deviation. Those are in millimeters. Apical deviation. Guided has the lowest. The angular deviation. Guided has the lowest. So it's pretty clear the most accurate way to do this is fully guided, right? Plan your implant, print a 3D surgical guide and place it. This is what I used to do. I took a PVS impression, probably take a second impression. There's part of the CAD CAM workflow that I took out, but it shows that a huge amount of impressions, like 84% of impressions have an error. And if it's in the wrong place, you gotta retake it. So that's why I put that in there. Send the impression to the lab. Right now, I'm going to, at the time, I didn't have a cone beam. I referred to an imaging center. I'm going to wait for the patient to make an appointment. You ever, like, driving home, you say, what happened to so-and-so, right? All of a sudden, this patient pops into your mind. You've lost track of this patient. You referred them out. I wonder if they went and got this done. If the patient actually made an appointment with the imaging center, how long will it take to get the image transferred over to the lab to plan the case? Now you're waiting for the lab to call you or email you to schedule an online planning session. You're going to accept the invitation, wait for the appointment, spend time in an online meeting planning the case. Now, I would 
be willing to guess or willing to bet whoever's planning that implant did not go to dental school and they did not do a specialty training program. Okay. There's someone who learned how to place implants with computer software and you get the privilege to pay them to do it with you. So then I'm going to wait for the lab to print and ship the guide, wait for the patient's appointment, right? We totally lost control of the case. It cost me $125 to plan that case with somebody, $135 for the, the surgical guide, $50 for a sleeve, $25 for a stone model. I don't know if that's a typo. That's what they said, stone model, but it's 3D printed. I'm not sure why I have to pay for that. They don't even need to print it. Shipping and handling, $13 tax and refund for wasted time, zero. Because I lost a lot of time. That's months. Or you know what? We can do it ourselves, maybe in the same day. This is an all digital, fully guided in office workflow. I used my Emerald scanner, I used my comb beam, I used Romexa software. Okay. This, all right, I don't have enough time to tell you how cool Romexa is. This is the glue for the whole thing. I use my Form Labs. A two printer. I used a Camlog Easy Implant. I sent it to Vulcan Dental Lab and I milled the crown with my trusty E4D mill. All right, let's take a look at this. This is my scan of the arch. Here's the opposing. Here's the crown I designed in Plaid CAD Easy, which is one of the modules for Romexis, because I want to begin with the end in mind, right? I want the restoration to have the proper occlusion, be in the right spot. Here's the comb beam. And here's how easy, just a short little video to show you how easy it is to fit the model. I'm gonna click on the intraoral scan and I'm simply gonna find similar areas on the scan on the right side and the left side. Use a right click. And this video is old. I would do this a little differently now. I would probably select something on the lingual. I'm also gonna admit that that was a really crappy cone beam because the assistant cut off the front of the teeth, all right? But it didn't really matter because that's not how we're making the surgical guide and the area that I really needed was there. So now that we fit the model of the arch, we're gonna have the restoration snap into place. This is really cool. Use existing match, bam, there it is. Okay, we're gonna scroll through, we're gonna look at the adaptation how the models fit, very nice. So there it is, right inside Romexis, there's a surgical guide module. You don't have to export it. You don't have to import it to a, an online service. You don't have to pay an import or export fee, whatever, right inside. This surgical guide software is so easy to use. It literally, it takes longer to export the STL file to your desktop than it takes to design the guide. There it is, it's, it's uh, printed. I printed the 3D model. I used to print the, the model. I don't print the 3D model anymore because I've done enough of these that I know it fits. There's the implant day of placement. There's the custom abutment. Here it is in the mouth. There's the occlusal view. There's a nice little composite resin fill in the access opening. All right, remember the cost. Here's my new cost, okay? Now this is taken right from the Form Labs 2 uh, website. You can eliminate the $19 because that's if you're using Blue Sky Bio, right, for an export fee. The dental resin, uh, surgical guide resin, $4.39 and then some in the tank, it's a little over $5. They're using, in this example, a $5.40 uh, sleeve. Now remember the, the lab was charging $50 for a sleeve and I can buy one the one I buy are seven bucks. So for $12.13, I can print a surgical guide with a sleeve in it. It was costing me $361. So the difference is about $350. If I take the cost of the software, all right, and divide that in there, it's less than 13 surgical guides. And now I'm taking money from my right pocket and putting into my left. That's the magic of using this software all together, using all the pieces of the puzzle. So in office, 12 bucks, traditional lab, 361.
Now let's look at the restoration. We've got our implant in. If you haven't heard of true abutment, I suggest you look them up. So they're a lab in California, a digital lab. We use the scanner, true abutment, and my E4D mill for this case. This is a um, scan now, I believe, with the Emerald and the newest software. You can see it's got the shade assist there. It says that tooth is a B2. So I'll go back to that, sorry. So the first thing you do, you'll notice this tab up here is pre-op. You're gonna take the healing abutment out and you're gonna scan the tissue without the healing abutment. Then you're gonna go down here to the scan body tab. You're gonna put the scan body in and you're gonna now scan that in the mouth. And that's what it looks like from the occlusal and the buccal views. And then you're gonna send it digitally because we can export files without paying a fee. We're gonna send it to true abutment. Now I want you to notice they use three shape. Okay, a lot of labs are gonna use three shape software. Romexis plays nice with other software and that's very important. They can easily import the file. It's very accurate, they trust it, they know it's gonna work. In a couple days after I've sent the files over, they send me an email and it's got these pictures in it. And I look at the pictures, it's got the design of the uh, abutment, it's got the design of the crown. And I literally just say, okay, go for it. They start milling the titanium the abutment and about a day later, maybe two, they, sent, they email me the STL file for the crown. There's the abutment in place in the mouth. I try the abutment in first, then I try the crown over the top of it, right? Notice here, this is Romexis. This is all the modules are over here on the left. CAD CAM, import for milling, all right? I've got the email. I export the STL file to my desktop. I click on import for milling. Then I'm this little menu comes up. I select um, browser select there, goes to my desktop. I find the file and it goes right to the milling tab in plan CAD easy. There's the access opening. I mill it. Here is the fit of the custom abutment and the crown. Now this is cemented right now. That abutment there is cemented because I've tried them in you know, one at a time and then together, I know I've got line of draw. I can actually cement this to the abutment in my hand, right? We take a little micro brush, we quickly clean out the access hole to get the cement out of the access hole. I can clean all the cement around the abutment uh, crown interface and I'm not gonna worry about periimplantitis from cement below my crown. So there it is in the mouth. Not the prettiest mouth. All right, there's my restoration. Scan body, $25. A mill titanium custom abutment and crown from True Abutment, including the design file, $204. An Emax block, about $34 for a total of $263. Now I was using a great lab in Michigan, $16, I added the $16 for another for a remake. They were charging me $517 for milled titanium custom abutment and a crown for a total of $549. All right, now let's look at the, the, uh, the two. 263 plus 12 or 361 plus 549, all right? $635 difference every time you do this workflow because you have the milling unit in your office. So now, going back to the formula, you, you only need to mill, uh, mill 14 crowns in a month. So if you did, one implant restoration every other week, this is your reality. So step three, put the pieces together, right? Use all the pieces of the digital dentistry puzzle to increase your production and efficiency and decrease your overhead. I'm actually able to go back now and look at how I can lower fees on my implants to get patients to do them. So the last step, all right, don't merely survive, but we need to thrive, right? We need to look at slingshotting, all right? And I'd say the way to do that is with digital dentistry. This is Romaxis. 
This is the brains of the whole operation. These are all the modules. You don't have to buy all the modules. You can piece them together. You can add them on later. The cool thing is it's really just turning on a license. That's all it is. So plan Mecca, um, the five-year five -year total cost is very low. There's only one scanner on the market that has a lower five-year cost than the, than the Emerald. The warranty and support have been top notch for me. If you're looking at getting a full system and you look at the full cost over five years, you're looking at 170 to $180,000 purchase. And I, I honestly, I just can't fathom why you would wanna spend that much money when you can do it for about 50% less. I don't have to pull a cart around. I can literally unplug it and go room to room. All my files are on this. I have Romexis software on every computer in every operatory. So I can show every patient what I'm doing. I can bring the scanner in on a new patient, do a complete scan in about two minutes and show them to their face, all right? That's powerful. Nobody's ever done that to them before. Nobody's ever taken a full scan, a live video of their mouth, right? If you're gonna have cone beam, there is nobody that has lower dose than Plan Mecca. They might tell you they're close, but ask for how they achieve those doses, all right? You wanna make sure there's no loss of diagnostic quality and nobody has calm. I already talked about Romexis. Rome Literally, you can stay on the same laptop, go start to finish and never go anywhere else and do everything you need to plan an implant. Freedom of choice to add modules, I said before, a lot of the updates, I bought my Emerald S in the fall, and there was an update about a week later that dramatically improved the speed of the scanner. And I'm told there's one coming out yet again this summer that's gonna make it even better. And the open architecture files, that is hugely important. Um, they will tell you there's a workaround. Workarounds aren't always easy. The open architecture is a big deal. If you're not really doing a lot of digital dentistry right now and you're just getting your toes wet, you don't really know what you don't know. You can't see what you're gonna to wanna to do in a few years. So please don't pigeonhole yourself. You need to be able to use these files any way you want. So I'm the boss, right? I'm a businessman and I'm a healthcare provider, okay? I spent a lot of money during quarantine while I wasn't making any money. Right. And it really thought I really had to think, how am I going to do this coming back? OK, you're not making I mean, staying in business for some people, they, they might not stay in business. All right. So this really highlights that we have to be smart business people. But being a business person has to come second to being a healthcare provider. The entrepreneurial strategy in your practice should never come ahead of the healthcare strategy. And this is why digital dentistry is so great, because the digital dentistry all right, makes, helps your business wise, but it supports the healthcare that you're giving to the patient. So it's a synergistic effect. So if you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change, right? So uh, I wanna be helpful. Um, probably the easiest way to get a hold of me, you know, you can email me. You can use my mobile number, you know, text me and say, hey, this is so-and-so, and I saw your presentation, and I got some questions. Um, I'm willing to help. Um, there's definitely some learning curve to some of this stuff, and if I can help you skip some of that, um, I'd like to. So take a screenshot of this screen. Reach out to me anytime you want. I'm available. You can find me on the Internet if you want. I'm going to... Um, as we're doing this, I'm going to slowly switch over to, to Troy. Thanks so much, Doc. That was great. I, uh, yeah. I want to remind everybody that uh, Dr. Young is not on the payroll of Next Level or Plan Mecca. So, but That's true. He's super passionate, and you've done such a good job of integrating it and um, creating that, that profitable um, 
uh, what's the word, the, the, a profitable and, and efficient uh, workflow. workflow. Yeah, exactly right. So Troy, take us, take us to the end and um, we'll, get, we'll get some of these questions answered as well. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks for everybody. We're, we might go a little bit over, but um, I think we're going to get into the meat and, eat, meat and potatoes of the questions here in a minute. We good here? Looks good. Okay. So thanks again, uh, Dr. Young, for your uh, expertise and knowledge clinically. It's uh, it's always good to have some foundation there and and uh, understand how people can benefit from the technology, from patient to doctor to staff, all along the way. Um, I'm gonna back up here for one second here and start at the top. Play. Okay. So. Wanted to just talk a little bit about kind of Plan Mecca, who we are, the products that we offer, and just kind of recap quickly, um, and kind of talk a little bit about about the why that maybe that motivates us to get things done, the way we do things, and how we charge on and go forward. Um, and this is something I kind of had some time during COVID to think about, and how I could plan uh, plan best to to talk to clients and talk to uh, business partners about. Um, sending a message of, of patient health care and drive revenue. And I kind of thought about this and it kind of hit home for me a little bit is during the civil war and during the revolutionary war, there was a flag bearer and that flag bearer would wave his flag. Um, and he was really responsible for the battalion to know their way on a smoke filled battlefield. And I kind of felt like this was really poignant from a Plan Mecca standpoint, because I believe in kind of the colors of Plan Mecca and I believe in kind of some of their innovations and things. Um, and what they do for patient care. In so doing, I also realized that there's an important role here for these flag bearers. They were also responsible for uh, the battalion's uh, uh, wages and retirement plans, which I thought was very interesting. So, you know, his job was very well protected, but it was also a very, very risky job. Obviously, he didn't have a weapon, he had a flag, but I felt really, uh, really kind of charged about this and thought, you know, I really care about the clients. I care about the patient, but I care about the revenue as well. So here's a way that I think we can help uh, everybody along the way uh, with respect to uh, Plan Mecca's messaging. Uh, we're obviously a Finnish company. The original founder of the company, Heike, is still the founder today. He's still part president of the company and CEO. It's his baby. It's his company. He deals with his practice and his, his vision just as much as a private practitioner would. Um, and so it's a really important that he drives innovation. We have a lot of engineering and a lot of innovation. And I think it's important to know that innovation really trickles down to first the patient care and then on so forth uh, benefits the, the staff and the, uh, the, the doctor as well. As Mike Dinzio talked earlier about not just benefiting the doctor, we want these products to benefit everybody. We have a new facility in Chicago. It's state of the art um, from a, a distribution standpoint. Obviously, we needed American uh, needed a building on American soil. This is amazing uh, place. Uh, we do VIP tours there for doctors looking at all of our equipment. We're a healthcare company. We do a lot more than just imaging. We do chairs, units, cabinets, uh, LM instruments. Uh, we're a very, very diverse healthcare company and we pride ourselves on um, making sure everybody's well educated on our product. And in my opinion, health is wealth, um, especially in light of COVID today. We want to make sure that we're all more conscientious about what are the invisible factors in our world? Uh, whether that be COVID, whether that be radiation, whether that be um, anything that can harm our body, you know, the healthier you can be, um, the wealthier you are because you're able to charge on and go forward and be productive in your life because you're healthy. Um, I think it's important. Um, something that needs to be mentioned as well um, is, you know, in light of COVID, the ADA has made some recommendations um, that are very uh, enlightening, obviously, for Plan Mac. It's actually a nice layup because we believe heavily in extra oral imaging. Um, the ADA has suggested now that whenever possible, doctors take into account extra oral uh, imaging as much as possible in lieu of intraoral. This will reduce, obviously, droplets and aerosols, uh, barriers, things like that that can introduce saliva into the environment. Um, and Plan Mac's message really a long, for a long time has been taking more extra oral imaging. Um, it's, it's, a, it's an amazing piece of technology when you talk about Promax extra oral imaging and what it can do for a practice. So when I talk about Plan Mecca with, with people, I always talk, you know, there's a big elephant in the room, but price technically isn't a feature because price doesn't necessarily benefit everybody. 
it really benefits the doctor, right? He's got to, he or she has to write the check for the, for the piece of equipment, but it's got to deliver a certain value. And if the features don't tie in everybody involved during the imaging process, I think that that, that feature is, loses its luster. So the patient, first and foremost, they're fearful of dose. They're fearful of associated pain at a practice. And we want to make them as comfortable as possible. Um, and so that, you know, during the diagnostic part of the examination, that they feel comfortable and want to proceed with more of the uh, more of the procedures. The clinical staff, right? We provide some tools on our machines that are unique, such as the Calm and the Ultra Low Dose, as Dr. Young mentioned, um, for practical use. Um, these are going to provide extra levels of patient safety, but they're also going to deliver better clinical results, and they eliminate things like retakes. Uh, the, the Calm feature is really an amazing algorithm, an amazing piece of technology. And then lastly, the clinician. Uh, the clinician wants to obviously build trust with the patient and continue on and drive forward with the patient care and do a more comprehensive exam. The doctor wants excellent image quality, he wants efficiency or she wants efficiency, and an accurate diagnosis to drive the, re the return on the investment. So again, we're talking about value, not necessarily discounting. So how does a practice really learn to change? Um, this image I thought was kind of interesting because these guys are getting ready to do a high five and in today's day and age, they're probably not going to do a high five, right? So at least they create the space around the sun. So practice can learn to change in a couple of different ways, but by using a diagnostic tool that can elevate their game um, to be safer and do a more comprehensive examination for the patient. Dr. Young was talking about taking a 3D and adopting that as the ultra low dose PA. Really, it's an amazing thing to do because we know from the studies that, that we're finding these, um, we're not finding these lesions as prominently unless it's a really big problem, the ultra low dose modality um, 3D is gonna help solve that issue. Plymeca's innovation really provides this type of technology and nobody else can do it. So we talked about having calm and ultra low dose and we have an extra oral bite wing feature as well as Dr. mentioned that gives a high diagnostic quality value images and you see about 30% more anatomy in that image. And then I'm here from a care standpoint as a representative obviously to take care of the client um, and see that the practice is educated on the product and is supported long term. Um, I don't think of these things as sales, and I'm going to go away from selling just a little bit. These are really partnerships because I think when we create uh, an environment for the patient and for the practice, you become a partner. I mean, I have offices call me all the time that want me to come back in and, and help them with uh, questions and answers about something they've, they've done wrong with their machine or they, they've got a problem. It's a partnership, so it's involved more than just sales. This is about support and to doing what's right for the practice and for the patient. For that, I wanna talk about really the ABCDs of Plan Mecca Imaging. It's really simple. So this is just kind of our foundation of the features that, we are, that are unique to us. So the autofocus modality on panoramics gives us consistent images. And what we're able to do is we're able to position the patient in the pan and identify where the anterior root tips are prior to taking the panoramic image. This ensures that we give great image quality in the anterior region when on a lot of panoramics, this becomes very unclear. Bite wings, we're an evidence-based extra oral bite wing um, innovation, um, have we had that innovation in our, our product. We have five major universities that have done studies on our extra oral bite wings and found them to be highly diagnostic. And we're the only brand that actually has those studies to back up that claim. The Calm software, as Dr. mentioned earlier, Patient movement is um, detected in anywhere from 20 to 40%. It depends, 20% is detected in the patient movement, that there can be artifact movement as well. And that image correction can help greatly enhance the image quality, eliminate retakes. And then the dose story, right? We talked about ultra low dose. We want 3D images at a lower dose uh, than a digital intraoral uh, image or a panoramic. So we've got all those bases covered. This is really our lineup of product. So when it comes to extra oral imaging, we've got everything for, for every dentist that they would want to do. So my question to an office is, what do we want to do with this machine? So as Dr. mentioned earlier, he's got a Plan Mecca, a Promax Classic, which would be uh, kind of the third one in the lineup from, from the uh, left. Um, really what these all have is a Promax panoramic functionality, and then they've got a different field of view uh, on their uh, 3D capabilities. So depending on what procedures you're going to do, I like to think of this as, I like a career cone beam. A career cone beam for me would state to a doctor that what procedures you're going to do today may change down the road, but I wanna give you at least a full panoramic view from a 3D perspective, which would mean roughly 10 centimeters high, 16 centimeters to the back so you can see past the condyles and above. Um, I like a career cone beam because it means 
you may want another cone beam at some point, but just procedurally, there's nothing you're going to need uh, a bigger cone beam for. So it will last you the lifetime of your, your practice. Wanted to jump in a little bit and just kind of recap on obviously the workflow again. We know that all of our cone beams tie in through room access and we can have a complete workflow with the Emerald scanner. Uh, we have a 3D printer as well, and then we can do all of our restorations with the, the plan fit or the E4D system. So it's important to know that we can tie all these technologies together to create that full system workflow at an affordable cost uh, to a practice. And actually it's much more affordable than a CEREX system with a cone beam. Just touching really quick on all of our modalities, everything talks through Remexis. Remexis talks to other practice management softwares. We also can work with other um, 2D imaging softwares in the panoramic modalities and have everything be transferred uh, via uh, just those, those links. That's it, I wanted to fly through this pretty quick. Um, I know it's late for some people, for doctor it's really late. I think he's, uh, he's got a practice tomorrow a little bit, but again, invite the questions and comments. If anybody would like a, a demo and you're in, in the Pacific Northwest, you can certainly email me, take my phone number down, give me a call. I'd love to, to visit with you and answer your questions. That's great. Troy, take us to the speaker view real quick. Just stop your share. Um, yeah. I, thought, I thought we could have a, a quick discussion. I, I, one of my favorite questions that was asked um, by, I think it's uh, Tiffany and um, I know Tiffany, she's texting me on the side here, but you know, doc, th this is to you. Um, you know, there's a lot of discussions about uh, PPO and reimbursement and how to incorporate, you know, getting your money back on this, this ROI topic. Troy and I have had this conversation a few times, but like, you know, I, I work with a lot of practices that are just getting going and you know, putting that investment into 3D right out of the gate, you know, might not be an option for a smaller practice, or maybe it is. Um, and then in kind of incorporating that also into the insurance conversation, um, you know, uh, what are your thoughts on just this big, big picture? Um, great question. So, so Tiffany did ask about um, my advice on staying in contract with PPOs versus going out of network. Uh, while providing the 3D dentistry um, that I do. And I, I answered it, but I, I appreciate you bringing this up. And one of the points I, I generally try to make, but, but fail to make uh, tonight um, is that, you know, we wouldn't think about, um, by the way, I just looked up at the clock. It was 11, 11, 11. That's pretty sweet. You guys believe <laughs> in 11? I mean, 11, 11, and 11 seconds. Anyway, um, you wouldn't think about having an extra unit in your operatories, right? It's just automatic. When you start a practice, you, you put an extra unit generally in every operatory. I'm gonna suggest, um, and because I've been doing CAD CAM for so long, I used to promote you know, CAD CAM maybe as the first big expenditure that you, know, you ought to consider. But I'm, I've totally changed. I think every practice should have a cone beam with ultra low dose because um, you, the diagnosis is going to drive your production because you can actually make a diagnosis. You actually get treatment in your chair, right? And then it won't be very long and you're going to have cash flow to afford the intro scanner and the milling unit. So a cone beam to me should be automatic in every office. And I, you know, finance it, figure out a way to make it happen because you're going to find more treatment than whatever that monthly payment is every month. I guarantee you, I see it every week. Um, as far as PPOs, um, you know, I live in the Motor City. Um, we're, we got the big three auto, you know, and we're dealing with lots of unions and it's a, it's a very insurance driven market. And there are some communities that are, you know, Oakland County um, used to be the third wealthiest county in the country. You wouldn't believe the homes over there. They don't worry about insurance over there. All right, but the, a lot of Metro Detroit, it's very insurance driven. And um, I tried to play the game and I only participated with Delta Premier, okay? And um, I almost lost my business, okay? I had a consultant who I won't name come into my office about four years ago 
Um, and he told me, Mike, you're a donor practice. I said, what do you mean? He says, you're donating all your patients to other practices. You're not open Fridays, you're not open Saturdays, you're not open late, and you're not in their network. What's the first question patients ask when they call my office? Uh, are you in my network? It, every single time a new patient calls, are you in my network? And we always said no. And you know what? It's just... So I, they said, yeah, figure sure. out a way to stop saying no. So in my area, the way I answered Tiffany was, it depends on the area that you're in, all right? And I'm going to submit to you that if you are taking PPOs, you better be very efficient, right? All the more reason to be digital, all the more reason to have everything I'm talking about, all the more reason to have a 3D printer to print your night guards, to print those provisional retainers so you're not paying a lab two or 300 bucks for a flipper. So depending on where you are, if you can get away with not participating, I'm all for it. Okay, I've had to figure out a way, you know, I'm coist trained, all right? I can do full mouth reconstruction because of what I've learned from John Coist. I can show you some great, very high quality things I've done over the years. I don't wanna sacrifice that. I'm not gonna sacrifice that. I'm gonna figure a way to make it happen even in a PPO environment. I guess, I guess what, I, what I loved about that answer, Doc, is, you first of all thank you for your total transparency but i get i get tiffany's question quite a bit is i i only want the you know a handful of insurances i gotta take delta i gotta take these but i don't want to i don't want to you know participate but i it always goes back to are you in growth mode and if you're in growth mode get as many patients as you possibly can and then figure out a way to get off of them it's easier to go backwards that way but I guess what I liked about your answer was you're finding ways to be more profitable in an insurance game. And I guess that's what I heard was, you know, your yeah. lab bills 12 bucks or whatever for that, that case you showed versus 300 and, and that's the game right there. So I, I think you're absolutely right. Demographics matter. Um, but I'm I'm nervous for the the offices that don't don't participate at least when they're in that growth mode. Yeah, and so here's you know also being very transparent. You know, I built a brand new office in 2006, 1.3 million bucks, beautiful office. Michael Unthank did the design. The design cost 27 grand. Yeah. Okay, I got all new equipment, right? Plan Mecca imaging units, Troy, in every room. Plan Mecca pan Seth. So in 2008, we know what happened. The bottom fell out. Mm -hmm. The county I practice in had the highest floor foreclosure rate in the country, the highest unemployment rate in the country. It took me years. In Mich you know, the, the country was a, they said it was a lost decade. In Michigan, it was more than a lost decade. Mm -hmm. All right. So that about killed me. Mm -hmm. And so now I'm, I'm just turned 52 during quarantine and I'm looking at, boy, how long can I do this? I'm not growing. I have to do something different because I'm relying on my practice as my retirement. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm looking at this and I'm going to suggest that maybe, I mean, everybody does it their way. Right. But if I have one practice and it's just me, I'm not going to have the retirement I want. So right now I'm in growth mode. I want to grow not sacrifice quality in any way, shape, or form. Then I want to hire somebody to help me out, and I'm going to buy another practice. Mm -hmm. I'm going to buy another practice. I'm going to get people to work for me, right? Taking every insurance, not every insurance, but <laughs> opening yourself up to PPOs is going to help you grow for sure. I'm open on Fridays now, half a day Fridays. I do one Saturday a month. I do four hygiene chairs on that Saturday. Wow. Okay. And I need to add another Saturday. We start at seven o'clock in the morning, half the year. And those seven o'clock appointments are booked. Mm -hmm. People in my area, they'd rather come in at seven than they come in at six or seven at night. Well, let's so, talk about, let's talk about that real quick. And Troy, let's bring you into this because you and I've had conversations about the PA imaging and the 3D and the pan and how can we get the reimbursement from Delta playing the insurance game. This kind of, this kind of falls right into the conversations that the three of us have had. 
what are your guys' ideas on how to incorporate? And I know Troy and M Michael, you're, you're saying, you know, scan everybody because you're going to find a lot more restorative, which you, you did study after study. You're going to find more. There's no question about it. But I know there's people in the audience that are thinking, you know, how can I offset some of the costs playing the insurance game? Didn't we come up with some ideas there to potentially take some 2D images? And how do you do it, Doc? I mean, and Troy, like, you guys can both talk about this. Well, so, you know, before I had a cone beam, when I sent patients out for one, I warned them it's going to be 250 or $300, right? Um, you, if you start asking, if you start telling patients, oh, you know what? Um, 2D is really not accurate. We need to take a 3D x-ray, but it's going to cost you, you know, $150. They're going to say no. So, you know what? I, I don't charge anything for any cone beam scan ever. And I don't care because I know I'm going to find the diagnosis and I'm going to get to do the treatment. I get to do the treatment, which is the most important thing. Now, um, what you could do is you could take a snapshot of your cone beam. And I don't, if I'm saying something illegal, <laughs> consult your attorney, okay, yeah. Yeah. before you do this. But the thought is you could take a screenshot of your cone beam and, and say you took a, a PA, all right, now maybe that's inappropriate, but if the insurance, there's been several times where the insurance asked me for an image and we're going in, my, my insurance gal is looking, there's nothing in there, there's nothing in there. I go, well, that's because we took a cone beam. So I would then go take a snapshot of the cone beam, give it to her and she sends it to the insurance and we get paid. Yeah. So I don't look at it as, you know, a PA is $29 or whatever. So what? You get to do perfect endo. Perfect fee for a cone beam scan, in my opinion. What's that? The perfect fee for a cone beam scan, in my opinion. Yeah. I mean. And have them pay out of pocket. I mean, that's affordable, right? They say yes to the scan, and and you find the dentistry. And that, yeah. that therein lies, once you get the work and you get the case acceptance, then you drive the revenue for the practice, and the patient walks away treated. Well, it's, yep. a, it's, it's a game of numbers, right, guys? Like, we just said that funnel, right? And if you offered everybody patient financing, if you offered everybody the scan and not, you're, the, the basket at the top is bigger and ultimately, you know, the, the bottom of the funnel is going to be bigger. Does that make sense? So it, it absolutely is a, is a game of numbers. And, um, you know, it's a, it definitely is a mentality shift. Yeah. Well, I mean, one of the conversations that I've been having with a lot of doctors here lately is, you know, coming up with a marketing plan to purchase a cone beam and say, now what do we do with it? Okay, so now, you know, how many patients a week are you gonna see? You know, and if they say, well, I think I can see 150 patients a week, great. Every adult patient that walks in the door, offer them a free ultra low dose cone beam scan. Of those that say yes, you know, maybe it's 30, you're gonna find dentistry on statistically 10 of them that you're missing. No, you're gonna uh, find statistically 90%. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, I mean, it, it's, it's a no brainer. If you just buy the technology, you have to use it. Don't let it sit in the corner. How many times has somebody bought something and then they thought it was great and then they don't use it they, like an air abrasion unit, right? It gets stuck in the corner and collects well, dust. You know, I did that, Troy. I had the, I had the 3d diagnostic ability and it sat there for really four years until a guy told me he thought I was full of shit, right? To really, I mean, I had started doing it more and more, but we just weren't, it wasn't an, it wasn't an always one of John Quaise's thing is always, this is what we always do. And when you always do the same thing and you have a system, right? So now it's an always before it was a sometimes most of the time. Um, Instead of taking three PAs on something to find the right angulation on the route, you take a one, one cone beam scan for the equivalent dose and get the whole picture of the whole mouth. I mean, it's right. And I'll also, I'll also tell you this. Um, I've referred some the 3d is awesome for also deciding when you don't want to do treatment so my assistant nadine she's unbelievable she's from germany she married an american military guy came to the states they have they have to train three years to be an assistant in germany and she's sitting there looking at the cone beam with me she goes oh we don't want to do that one you're right i mean you would never see that on a 2d you would totally miss that and you would get yourself into big trouble. So it's, it's good for uh, um, more than just diagnosis. Sometimes you need to know your limitations and when to refer to. 
Yeah. yeah. So you're saying you just you get to become a much better quarterback. Yep. Yeah. Well, guys, um, I think we answered all the questions. Let's give it one more minute. If you have any last minute questions for Dr. Young or Troy, um, please send them into the either the chat or the or the Q and A. Um, we'll do a follow up email uh, to all of you. Thank you for participating. Um, any any last words, Troy, M Michael? Um, no, I mean it's going to be. Sorry, Troy, go ahead. Uh, I you know thank you for everybody that that logged in and joined us. Um, I'd love to do this again, so you know we can continue this on. Yeah, yeah, it was it was super educational and doc and Doctor, I love your style. It's it's very uh, uh, numbers driven, very case study driven and, and less opinion. And um, yeah, it, overall, I, I appreciate your transparency and your uh, just you sharing your experience with us. It's awesome. Yeah, I appreciate that. You know, it, it, I try to be evidence-based. I try to reduce risk. Um, you know, the science is the science, right? Yeah. And the numbers are the numbers. And um, you know, if we don't, share them and learn from each other. I'm really not helping anybody. I, I think I answered um, most of the questions it looks like. Yep, you did a great job there. Thank yeah. you, thank you. Yeah. So we'll, we'll, this video is gonna be recorded, or was recorded, so we'll have, um, uh, you know, we'll have that available to send out to anybody that missed, but um, thanks again. I appreciate your guys' time. Dr. Young, go to bed. <laughs> have a good night. Once again, you, you know, it's a beautiful you, sunset you got there. I can't go. To, I can't go to bed now. Now I'm wired. You're all jacked up. That's right. Go go review some cases. Maybe you missed. Uh, maybe you missed some some deals. Yeah. <laughs> all right, guys. Have a Bye, good thanks, night. Thanks so much. I appreciate you. Thanks, everybody. Take, Take care. care. Bye. -bye.